one, it was a philosophy that we could do more with with less capable systems. And that's counterintuitive, that that there was a quality to quantity that we had never really understood. And second was the technical underpinning of, of affordable launch, the ability to access space much easier and uh, much quicker than we ever had in the past. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of DIB Innovators. Today I'm speaking with Josh Hartman, Chief Growth and Strategy Officer at Lightridge Solution. Uh, it's also kind of fun because Josh and I went to the Air Force Academy back in the day, so we have a long history. So thanks for joining, Josh. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. You bet. Well, A, thanks for your service. Thanks for looking after our nation and the career, uh, varied career as you've uh, moved through, uh, always putting that on the forefront. But why don't you tell me a little bit, tell our listeners, you know, how you uh, how you got to where you are through kind of the military and your journey. I think it'd be interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, I went to the Air Force Academy because I wanted to be an astronaut. And so uh, my dad was actually a, actually a conscientious objector. And, and oh. so, yeah, I don't think you ever knew that. But um, despite that, he was fully supportive of me going. I spent four years there planning to fly and go on to be an astronaut. But you know, that was a year that, that we had peace dividends. And, and uh, so really one of them, one of the early pivotal pivotal parts of my career was was out of came out of failure i mean that i didn't get a pilot slot which is not you know the whole real reason i went there and so i had to pivot literally to do something else and my degree was in physics and i loved space and so i followed a bunch of our of our buddies out to los angeles air force base where they happened to be making satellites and and that was my exposure uh beyond you know the academy curriculum to space and a, and a passion for space that uh, took me down that that course. Very cool. And then from the from the Air Force, uh, how did you continue? You know, marching along. I did the the normal thing that that you do as an Air Force officer and check the blocks and went to the Pentagon for my second career uh, move and and got to work at the National Reconnaissance Office building you know quote unquote spy satellites and you know as an acquisition officer you don't get much exposure to operations but I had a you know the NRO is a very uh, operationally oriented organization and uh, one of my last jobs there before I decided to transition out of the Air Force in fact it was defining uh for that decision was for me to run around the globe uh with with other you know blue and and green suitors and talk to folks who were at the at the embassies working for the cia or or talking to folks who were who were deployed in the uniform and, and in harm's way about the hard problems that they were trying to overcome from a intel and an operations perspective and then we would come back and build a essentially a tiger team that would try to rapidly build a solution and deploy that right to the same folks we were just talking to, you know, six, nine, 12 months ago. And it was all about leveraging space. And it really, it taught me that, that, um, space, which had been such a strategic thing, a, a strategic tool for Intel, primarily, you know, the Cuban missile crisis and tracking, uh, you know, site development in Korea, et cetera, that it could be a very tactically, uh, deployed capability and really help troops uh in 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 harm on a on a regular daily basis rather than just inform the national command authority the president on what was happening at the strategic level and so as i transitioned out of that job i had a decision to make either go back to doing acquisition programs and and watching things evolve over the course of five six seven eight years which is how long it took to build a satellite or try to transition somewhere else where i could have a more of an impact and, and reshape how space was being deployed. And and for me, that meant outside of the uniform, oddly enough. So I, I was fortunate enough to, after a, a while, to, to find somebody who was um, up on Capitol Hill in one of the committees that was willing to take a chance on a young guy that thought he had a lot of great ideas about space. And and so actually was a Naval Academy grad who welcomed me on board to the Armed Services Committee. And then and then from there, I spent, you know, four and a half years both on the Armed Services Committee and then transitioned to the Appropriations Committee to uh, really reshape strategy and how we use space and, and investment in in our space systems overall. How was that working on the Hill? <laughs> I don't know that. It was, yeah, Fascinating. It was, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Uh you know, at the time, we were going through a lot of reform as it related to to um, 
earmarks and 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 so there was a a lot of uh scrutiny on what were really good government initiatives and and i realized that that earmarks can be porkish but they really are a, a, an instrument for change they they're the they're the one way that the Cong- the congress has uh to put in what they think are good government ideas and so we really were able to reshape as an individual staff member and a couple of other of us who you know colluded to to work in the same direction we really to reshape the air force's space enterprise over the course of a couple of years and that was really that was really powerful. It was really, you know, you, you could really see in real time almost things changing. And, and that was when, you know, today what's happening in space is they're moving from, from these school bus size uh, satellites that take eight years to build to something that's more of the size of your microwave and take two years to build, maybe less than two years. Um, and rather than six of them, you launch 600 of them. Uh, and that was something that we really started to advocate back in the early 2000s is a really fundamental shift in how the, the Air Force and now Space Force applied a, a joint force capability and then protected that that joint force capability. And, and so it not only changed the way we look at national security from a space perspective, but it changed the entire economics of the space industry from what used to be building billion dollar units to now, you know, building $20 million or $10 million or $5 million units. What do you think the big change was? I mean, obviously, from that time to now, there is massive change. I mean, space is affordable. You know, SpaceX has jumped in there. There was a time when we had no heavy lift. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was owned by Russia. You know, what was the big catalyst? Was it, you know, one of the, you know, the intelligence that we could see? Or was it the technology that reached the page? What did you, what do you see are like the key enablers that really put this on a cycle? Because, man, we are cooking now. Yeah, I, I think... It was a couple of things. It was one. It was a philosophy that we could do more with with less capable systems, and that's counterintuitive. That that there was a quality to quantity that we had never really understood. And second was the technical underpinning of of affordable launch, the ability to access space much easier and uh, much quicker than we ever had in the past. And and SpaceX really played a, a strong role in that, but they weren't, you know, they were not the only company at the time who was really pushing the envelope on how to figure how to how to rapidly deploy systems to space. There were a number of other concepts, and we've got a number of options today, particularly in the small launch market, that that are really very affordable and give us um, a lot of optionality on how to get access to space. Oh, that's cool. So as you then, you know, pivot out of that, how did you find yourself being with first GEOS, you were the president of GEOS, to now, yeah. you know, chief cross strategy officer for Lightridge? So I, I, I spent a, a tour in the Pentagon after, uh, as, a, as a political appointee in the acquisition organization, also sort of carrying on what we did in Congress for another almost three years. Um, and then as the administration changed, I, I found myself unemployed. Frankly, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do, so I started doing some consulting. And 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 you know, the first point I would make to anybody is uh, owning your own business is a really empowering and uh, tremendous learning experience. And um, you know, as you start to build employees and you're and you're trying to make um, payroll, it becomes real. And the accountability of you know how you make decisions and the thoughtfulness is not thing that when you were an employee you necessarily appreciated but it's a it's a um it's a really good opportunity so anybody would ever have the chance to start their own business i really encourage them to think hard about that because it's a it it is um it's a good good deal i think overall for for folks who have the ability to do that but i ended up building a consulting firm that had another 40 folks uh, attached to me over five years and we sold that to another firm i became a partner there and I guess what's important about that experience as it relates to the bigger picture is, you know, when I left government, I had been there for 16 years. I was a blue suitor, then a civilian for a while. I did get my MBA, but I didn't know really anything about business in the truest sense. But helping companies think about business over the next nine years and getting into private equity uh, investment and supporting mergers and acquisition and looking at how you filter for selection on your next acquisition and um, really understanding how to, you know, what the levers are for creating cost savings and then developing new technologies. All that really was a, the next nine years was a crash course on, on all of that, that brought me to Geost. 
and and how did that happen um you know i, I was done i was done giving other people advice how to run their company i thought i wanted to get in and run my you know a, a real company that built hardware and software so i i started looking around at some of the founders that um had small companies that i thought were going to take off and go somewhere and and i approached four different companies and two of them were interested and my proposition was simply you know here's my background here's the things i've done i think i can help you and in, in both cases it was help your wife it was a mom pop shop grow your company and then take it to market and and i don't i won't work for a salary i'll work purely for equity and that act will be based on whatever gains we make together from today moving forward and that it was a bit audacious i think to go into some of these you know folks who own their business for 14 15 years and and had been trying to create growth and suggest that i might be able to do it a little bit better than they did and geost was was you know the the, the founder tony gleckler was uh, very interested in the idea, um, was very open to, to trying to work together and figure that out. And, and he set some pretty aggressive growth goals, you know, basically tripling the company. And we were able to accomplish that in about 18 months, actually, when we started work after we started working on it. So that's, that's how Geos came. And then Lightridge came because after that, um, you know, we, we had found the right sponsor on the private equity side and we had pitched them a, what we call a buy and build uh strategy which i had done before as a consultant which means you buy you know find a good solid base company that's doing good things for the future you start adding capability onto it sort of a mr potato head concept and so we made two additional acquisitions the first was a, a advanced lidar system company out of denver uh called ophir uh and then the uh the third acquisition we made was out of northern virginia uh, trident systems which did two different things one it had low swap electronics that we could couple with geos low swap low size weight and power uh payloads and really start to move towards autonomy on orbit but the second thing it did which was which was really is 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 super helpful from a business perspective because it produces a lot of cash but but it also helps because it expands our brand into you know a broader defense set of customers they're doing a lot of multi-domain communication systems for the army and the marine corps and and also uh on the cutting edge side of things they were building predictive logistics and maintenance solutions so hardware and software solutions that would go into to army marine corps uh vehicles uh that would allow them to not just make the the depot maintenance process more efficient, but plan mission uh, around that. So if you knew that you were going to go out on a convoy and your your truck was about to break down in the next four hours, you'd pull that truck out and put in one that looked like you know had a much longer set of legs. On it. So thereby, you know, preventing troops from getting caught, you know, sitting ducks. Very cool. So you're uh, well. What was your strategy just from a business side? You know, how did you grow in eighteen months, three plus three x, from someone that's already in their mind trying to do it? How, what was your what were your key kind of business drivers? Well, I you know it was a very technical company, and so we always joke about uh, both people from NSA and 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 engineers in general. You know, the difference between a extrovert and an introvert in those organizations are. Uh, the, the introverts are looking at their shoes and the extroverts are looking at other people's shoes. So I just asked everybody to look at, you know, beyond, you know, actually look up rather than, than looking at shoes. And so we started reaching out much more aggressively at customers, writing white papers and thinking about things. And this is probably the most important thing, um, thinking about things in the construct of the mission itself. So how do we fit in the architecture? What problems are we really solving? How can we expand upon what they're trying to do that we know are gaps. But it, it's, it was a mission fit first orientation rather than just trying to sell widgets. And I think these guys who were, who were brilliant were in some ways more about the widget than they were about the operations. That's awesome. Uh, funny story when I was working at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, <laughs> walking down the hallway, it said wet, wet paint on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't stick your hands into the wall <laughs> so like oh, that definitely resonates yeah that, uh, that's what they're looking that's right uh that's great so you're uh you've got the three companies you know are there 
Do they work together or, or just business ways? Did you integrate them all? Because that's often a challenge when you start getting into these mergers and, you know, incorporating yeah. from business systems to just the overall kind of operations or do they run independently and then you're just trying to bring them into other contracts together? How, how do you look at that from a both of business? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So in each of the three businesses, they were growing fairly rapidly or or we knew had the potential to grow fairly rapidly on their own. So the strategy first was let's let's optimize within the businesses so that we can create the growth that we know lives, you know, inherently in there. And so for example, with Trident, we're we're going to double in revenue this year and we'll probably double again next year just just looking at backlog alone. That's not, you know, we we'll, we could grow even more than that depending on how much new stuff comes in through the course of the year. Once we hit a certain critical mass, and more importantly, we understood how to scale within the businesses, then we could start to experiment with how to bring them closer together. We we always, though, from the very beginning, started to put together common services in the back office. Like our growth and strategy process was always run in a centralized construct across all three of, of the organizations. Our finance was always run across all three. Our HR quickly became run across all three. And so we just slowly, as the business looked like it could continue to stack new services on it without affecting the growth path of the individual business units, we began to put more on it and, and extract some of that, that overhead out of the business units. And so today, from a management administrative perspective, we're pretty integrated. So now that we've got that in place, we're moving more towards product integration, where we're bringing together Geos payloads more with Trident's processors and taking Ophir's payloads from Airborne and moving them to space. And is that is that proven to be, as you're looking at that, a lot of opportunity uh, when you do that? Uh, for your customers, you're bringing value with that? We are bringing value with that, but sometimes it takes a little time to seed the idea because... Uh, you know, there's not a lot of LIDARs in space, for example, and there's not a, and another idea that we're taking, we just had some success with the Space Development Agency on is taking the predictive logistics and maintenance AIML algorithms that we have on the Army Marine Corps vehicles and moving those to space. So it, it it's it's not always intuitive to folks why something that was on an airplane or on a, on a ground vehicle could fit into space or vice versa. And so you you really have to to take some time to sell the idea. Well, that's cool, Josh. So, you know, space, crazy times. It sounds like you guys are doing great, but obviously, you know, with the new Space Force, that's driving, you know, continuing to drive change to probably help spearhead back in the day as you were uh, working on the Hill. The General Saltzman talks about competitive endurance theory. How do you see that? And how is that going to drive, you know, I would say thinking of, the military and space and our capabilities in space from a national defense perspective and how will that specifically affect you i think we're still exploring what that means and but i think the most notable thing that i'll just touch on because we're still exploring what it means is competitive endurance um at the most strategic level from an, what i call an orbital warfare perspective means absorbing a first attack it means creating an environment where deterrence works as long as it can and then uh, and then being able to react to what we see as is uh, adversary crossing specific red lines, and and so in other domain, uh, we're a little more proactive, I think, in in how we take the fight to the to the adversary. And in this case, I think we're we're thinking about how to let the fight come to us, and then how to how to you know neutralize the the adversary as it's approaching, which is really a different construct. But it really, all of this, for what it means to, to orbital warfare and the rest of the Space Force, I think rests in taking lessons learned from other uh, domain and other, you know, other other tactics of warfare and applying them to space. So what it, what it means for, for my company is it, it means ultimately trying to, to support the idea that uh, there's three key tenets to to um, competitive endurance. The first is that you have to have a very strong space domain awareness capability that is really vigilant and persistent around the globe and in all orbits. And 
The second is that we have uh, systems that are resilient, survivable through that attack. And it may not be just systems, but it could be architectures as a whole. Uh, and then the third thing is that we're able to prevent and protect the joint warfighters from getting uh, caught in a in a space enabled attack. And where we play in that is is you know we build all the sensors uh, that will go into a space domain awareness architecture from the ground all the way up through geo past through the you know to cis lunar where we're looking at the odd orbits around the moon. We build all the processing that analyzes that that data and makes it actionable intelligence. Mm -hmm. We build a lot of the protection strategies in the classified realm on how to create resiliency in our architectures and our systems. You know, what, what does protection on orbit mean? What does defense of a, of a local asset mean? What are your countermeasures if this happens? So really, you know, building a robust perspective on, on protection strategies and implementing countermeasures. And we're, our company, Light Rich Solutions, right in the middle of that. And then the last part, I think, comes, you know, protecting the, the joint comes from achieving those other two. If we're able to have, you know, a, a vigilance all around space and see what's going on as it's going on and then create resiliency, react to it in the right way, then we will, you know, we'll be able to eliminate um, threats to to both space assets, but also to to folks you know in the air, on the ground, and at sea. So, not a space expert by any means on my side. I you know I, I feel like we have pretty good domain awareness in space. Is that not true? I mean, are there it's giant not, gaps? It's not true, and I don't know if this is uh, maybe inappropriate for your listeners per se. But uh, <laughs> have you ever seen the movie? It's inappropriate. <laughs> you ever seen the movie the jerk with steve martin in it mm -hmm. so you know the scene where he's getting kicked out of his mansion he's in his his robe he just wrote his last two dollar and 27 check and, and and he's got like one slipper on and his dog's running around behind him i won't go into his dog's name but um he starts walking to the door and he says i don't need any of these people anymore all i need is this chair and he picks up the chair and he walks a little further and he grabs the lamp and he says in this lamp and then he as as he walks the rest of the distance to the door, he sees a paddle ball game and a thermos, and and he gets outside and he's got this uh, this you know odd collection of things that don't fit together. Well, I'd argue that's how we built our space domain awareness architecture. It has been built piecemeal in stovepipes. They're not designed to work together. There's no coherency. It wasn't planned in that construct. It was okay. We need something at Geo that looks like this. Let's build a radar. Let's oh, we need something like that at Leo. Let's build a space fence. Uh, okay, how about you know how about SBSS? We'll we'll give it a gimbal. Oh, we don't really need the gimbal. Once we got it up there, we didn't use it. There's all kinds of you know. Let's put everything on GSAP and make it do everything for everybody. Well, maybe that's not really the right solution in the future. You know, there there needs to be more thoughtfulness put into it. And unfortunately, the you know. Uh, the SWAC is doing the, the Space Warfighter Analysis Center out of U.S. Space Command is doing a great job of laying out force designs across the space architectures. But space domain awareness is one of the last ones that they're that they're attacking, and it won't be ready for two more years. So, in that you know, the space uh, U.S. Space Command commander, the last one, said that SDA was his number one priority army guy this guy new guy air force guy general whiting has said the same thing neither four star has been able to get satisfaction from a systems perspective in in sda it remains to be poorly planned not really addressing the threats and a huge gap do you think that's because of just our bureaucratic process we don't have the right collaboration with you know, I would say, as I've done these podcasts, just seeing the innovation and thought process of how to solve problems exist more in you know, the commercial side. Is there is there not a good fusion of you know perspective, or is it you know why do you think that is that it's so challenging? Well, I mean, one thing is dysfunction, and the other is I would say immaturity, and that and the immaturity is not a bad thing; it's an understandable thing, and I'll talk about that second. The the disorganization piece of it is that there's too many people who have an opinion on what the systems should look like. There's not enough unity of effort and there's not um, a clear path to getting there. There's a requirements process that 
takes a lot of years to to document a, a real requirement. And at that time, the Chinese are already changing three generations of technology. Uh, and and the acquisition community is saying, we don't have a requirement for this, so we can't build it. And so I think there needs to be an overall requirements process that would, and that's just across all of acquisition, but particularly in these areas where our adversaries are out um, speeding us, you know, they're able to do it faster than, than we are. The immaturity problem is one where the Space Force is only five years old and they haven't had a lot of time to think about what orbital warfare means and what the, tra- the tactics and the techniques and the procedures to win will be. And therefore they don't know what the intelligence support to those operations should look like. And so the whole idea of strategy and doctrine from a Space Force perspective is still being developed. While it was in the Air Force, there was space strategy and doctrine, but it was always, you know, it was it was a second level effort. It wasn't, I think, taken very seriously because the only mission that was seen by the space component of the Air Force was force enhancement. And that was, do you have GPS? Do you have comms? Do you have missile warning? And that's it. And you have some intelligence from the NRO. But the NRO got to decide on its own, which is why guys like me were out running around to the 18th Airborne Corps and to the, you know, the embassy in Pakistan to figure out what what was their problems. Mm-hmm. And we were deploying real stuff as quickly as we could. People out at, you know, at SMC would have never understood that concept from a tactical space perspective. Yeah, it's hard to give space force too much grief when or joint operations and we've gone what from multi-domain ops to joint domain ops can we actually communicate together and get a clear air picture <laughs> or domain, all domain picture right not even in space and we can't do that we've been doing that for hell 10 years plus plus i mean i remember when i was in the pentagon i was fighting that battle between the air force and the navy on getting on a common air picture uh and I, I i didn't realize we still don't have that i figured someone had fixed it in the last 15 to 20 years but maybe not <laughs> So oh, it's it's a beast still, yeah. And, and how you control it, yeah, just fascinating from that perspective. Yeah, that's are they dealing? Are they is Space Force dealing on the acquisition sides? Are they dealing with like, you know, in the I'd say more on the Air Force. I think it probably applies to the Navy and Army. Yeah, capabilities versus platforms. You know, because we we do acquisition with platforms. You don't really acquire capability. You know, the yeah. acquisition system is that is that you know funneling over to space. Uh, force have, have you seen well previously it has been a discussion around platforms it's been i'm going to buy this system i'm going to buy this system and buy this system and and no real discussion about capability integration across those and what does it mean in a holistic perspective and that's that that's the point I, about i try to make about the steve martin scene in what what's happening now though what i'm really i mean i'm heartened to hear the conversations that are going on because it is much more about capabilities it's taking a holistic look at things and saying, all right, well, let's start with effects. What effects? And it's starting with the F2T2EA cycle, mm-hmm. find, fix, detract, um, you know, engage. There's another T in there. But target. it's target, target. Yeah, the most important one. It's, it's <laughs> well, starting with that. What effects do I want to have? And it's moving backwards into more of a BMC cubed construct that, so we inform, take the F2T2EA effects-based uh, capabilities we want, then let that inform what a BMC cubed infrastructure that would connect to that looks like. And then let's turn that into an ISR TC PED construct, task, uh, collect, process, exploit, dissemination. Let's link those cycles all up. And so we're doing that from a space perspective, I think. I'm mm-hmm. hearing, let's start at the end and move left in the chain all the way from what data am I collecting and why? Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's, that's a hard thing to do. That's the way our, you know, system works and yeah, they're. Well, what makes it harder for space is I think, and I'm not saying that the others, not that, that space is unique per se, but what's going to make it harder for space is they have to work backwards in that, in that chain. And then they have to automate it because the distance at which we will be operating, you know, at a minimum 400 kilometers range from the earth against things that are moving 17 and a half thousand miles an hour 
all the way up to things that are moving in non, well, generally non Keplerian orbit orbits, things that we don't understand, things that are maneuvering all the way out past the moon, which is, you know, another what I don't know, I can't remember what the distance to the moon is, but but at least twice the geo, so 72,000, 80,000 kilometers. Um, light takes a, a reasonable distance to get back and forth, uh, but RF takes a very long time. So comms of, of information coming back to the Earth and then allow a decision maker to make a decision on that data and then send something back to execute, a satellite will be dead by the time all that cycle takes place. So collection, processing, analysis, developing red lines, understanding the scenarios and creating COAs, and then taking action, all has to happen at the edge, on orbit. It can't come back down to the ground because we just won't have enough time. So, so autonomy is, is, you know, automating that is a, is going to, is a hard technological thing. If nothing more than, it's just hard for humans to let go of some of those decision processes. Well, can't we just put them on the next space station? No, we can have humans out there. We should, yeah, we can do that. We can forward deploy. I like that. That's idea. right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the mission, right? the grand vision. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to go back to something that just when we were talking about resilience and surviving in space, the thing that seems to me that is if we really get into some sort of warfare, war, a kinetic engagement in space. Yeah. How is, because I mean, these space, you know, you know better than me, but they're very thin, you know, I'd say shells of the satellites or the buses or whatever's running around. Like the debris that's going to be created seems like it would be like almost wipe out the entire, you know, wipe out large sections of things in orbit that would affect the entire world, not just us. I mean, is that true? Is that a misnomer in my mind? Or no, no. I mean, I think at some point it becomes a, a real issue, particularly in low Earth orbit where things are moving around at seventeen and a half thousand miles an hour. You know, this, the the velocity of a, a small piece of of paint. We've documented on the space station has as a tremendous impact the good news is that at leo low earth orbit space is a big place and things still travel according to the laws of physics and that they will rotate in the same around the same center of gravity that the that the object originally was so you're likely to have a cloud of debris that that probably drifts over time and gets bigger um I don't know, you know, depending upon the size of the satellite and the and the impact, that cloud will get bigger and become more of a of a problem. But it it what it it does eat up safe space. But there is the good news a lot of safe space. In in geosynchronous orbit, it's not as not as much of a concern because there there's not a lot of maneuvering things that are out there. And the things that are maneuvering probably maneuver around debris. Because they're not moving at the same speed as mm. they are in low Earth orbit, you know. And in, in in low Earth orbit, you have much more of a problem. And and the, you know, also compounding factor is U.S. commercial entities pumping up twenty thousand satellites, and now the Chinese are going to pump up another fourteen thousand satellites just on operating vehicles alone. We're going to have you know thirty to forty to fifty thousand satellites at some point in the future operating in low Earth orbit, and that by itself is more more than the number of debris pieces that we're tracking today. So it, it, it will get to some point where it's it's scary, but the truth is we're not, I don't believe we're anywhere close. Some of the analysis suggests that that we're not that close to knocking everything out of the sky with debris. Okay, that's good. That's good perspective. It is big. <laughs> that is for sure. It is big. It's yeah. pretty large. Well, okay, so back to Light Ridge. You know, what do you guys see as your future, you know, future in the next couple of years, any upcoming projects or initiatives that you're super excited about that you can share? Yeah, I, I think so. The Light Ridge, our tagline is making sense in space. And, uh, you know, what does that mean? It really means combine, combining the advanced uh, low size, weight and power sensors with that advanced processing at the edge that I talked about. And then being a part of this automation of the TC PED process, the BMC cube process and the F2T2 process. It is, I think we're, how we've tried to assemble all the parts and pieces of the company. It's where we put our IRAD into it's where we're trying to be market leaders for the future. Uh, and so I, I see us continuing to build, um, 
sensors for these more critical missions in space defense and missile warning. Uh, I also see us building the algorithms that help support the processing of that data and, and putting the next generation uh, of AIML capable processors with largely with the Versal technology. And that's a, a brand out of uh, one of the, the processing companies that is really enabling some of this capability. Um, and that will be that'll be a core part of what we do. Yeah, that's great. Exciting times, definitely. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, Josh, we're going to have to wrap this up. I could sit here and, in fact, I'm going to come out in D.C. just so we can uh, BS some more about it. I love it. Uh, what a great perspective and, you know, honor to have you on here. It's been cool. So, My pleasure. Um, Thanks for the, for the opportunity. And I always you're always welcome whenever you can yeah. let me know. Perfect. So if folks want to follow, you know, one of your uh, companies or your over, you know, like Ridge. Right. How would they follow you? Do you have a... Yeah, we're on LinkedIn and... Um, uh, both at the Light Ridge level and each of the companies have a site. And then we're at uh, lightridgesolutions.com. And then you can, from there, uh, learn more about the entire entity, or you can go into some of the individual business units, our space, air and space business unit, our, uh, our technology business unit, our C4SR business unit. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Josh. We'll talk later. My pleasure. Thank you for the time. Cheers. Take care.